Hello, welcome to the France 24 interview. Well, you and I know him as one of the greatest icons of modern times, a Nobel Peace Prize winner whose tireless fight for equality forever changed his country and perhaps the world beyond. But my guest today, Nelson Mandela, was simply granddad, a wise and loving family patriarch with whom a young Ndaba Mandela formed an indelible bond over many years living together with the great man under one roof. Now, Ndaba shares the life lessons imparted by his grandfather in a book, Going to the Mountain, and that book is now out in French as well. And those lessons about resilience, about love, reconciliation, are also at the heart of Ndaba's life mission as he labors to keep Madiba's legacy alive for a new generation of South Africans. Welcome to our studios here at France 24. Thank you very much. Let's cut to the chase here. It's, yes. um, listen, it's been almost 25 years. I believe this May will be 25 years since your grandfather became, slayed the dragon of apartheid <laughs> and became South Africa's first democratic president. First month in office, Nelson Mandela spoke of a rainbow nation in yes. South Africa. I think it was Desmond Tutu's original uh, phrase. Where is that nation today? I, I, I saw a recent World Bank report called South Africa the most unequal country in the world in terms of wealth and poverty. Right. What would your grandfather have said? Is his legacy being squandered? I, I don't think so. You know, right now, the, the most pressing issue or challenge in our country is the economy. Uh, we have a policy known as land appropriation without compensation, right. which is currently being discussed in Parliament, uh, where we seek to empower not only farm workers, but young people to get involved in agricultural business, because we know that the land is the most pressing issue. You know why land is so important? Because number one, it provides shelter. Number two, it provides food. So we want to try and break the cycle of poverty that existed for so long. That's a Cyril Ramaphosa, the current president. That's his policy. He's trying to amend the constitution in order to expropriate these farms. Well, it's not his, it's, it's the ANC's. Policy. policy. Yes. But de facto, it's his because he's president. It yes. will be seen as yes. his policy. Let me, the policy, when you say the word expropriation, especially in the context of, say, South Africa, you inevitably are going to think of, say, Mugabe in Zimbabwe. And it was an extremely controversial policy. Is 100%. There, are there similarities there? How is this different? No, this is very different because we have not actually started appropriating land. We are in a discussion to find out what is the most equitable way to actually go about it. We have called in civil society, corporates, as long as government, coming together to discuss how to move forward in a way that will suit all the interested parties. How does it work today in South Africa? How much of the land of the most fertile farmland is, say, owned by white farmers as opposed to black farmers? 80% is owned by white farmers. So when we talk about this redistribution of land or appropriation of land, we are essentially, to a certain extent, talking about expropriation yes. from white farmers. Yes, yes. I mean, to be honest with you, the current situation is not sustainable. Okay. It is not sustainable at all. I mean, sooner or later, you will find a position where people are fed up. They don't see any faith in the government or the ANC, and they believe that they should take the law into their own hands. And we have to avoid that by all means necessary. Let me ask you this. You, in your own, you met your grandfather first when you were seven. You actually moved in with him when you were 11, a year before he became president. Yes. You grew up in dirt poor Soweto, a yeah. dirt poor township, not yes. a homeland, but a township. Yes. So what is still dirt poor today? Um, has, it, has it fundamentally changed? Well, the, the, you know, it, it's, it's not dirt poor because I think what's happening is that we have some development, but the, the, the economy, again, when you look at the rand, how many times does it actually circulate within the black community, within the Soweto community? Mm, okay. Once or twice. Look at the Jewish community. Look at the Indian community. Six, seven times, eight times. You know, we have a big mall that came up, but when you look at majority of those rental spaces, the shop owners, they're still franchisees owned by the whites. What would your grandfather have thought? I know I keep asking you that question, what would Nelson Mandela have thought? But he, he, was, he had no illusions. He knew it was going to be tough. Did he think that a quarter century later, that in many minds, apartheid might, as some might suggest, still exist? Well, to be honest with you, I believe that the older generation achieved their objective of breaking down the physical chains that existed. Okay. And so once they've done that, it's up to them to now pass the baton to the next generation to keep pushing for more concessions to be made. You know, I don't think that it's up to them to decide what's going to happen 25 years later. I mean, what is the point of having a son and a grandson and a grandson? <laughs> to perpetuate the, right, <laughs> the, 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 the legacy. Yes, um, we, it's our responsibility now. 
they, they've done their job as far as I'm concerned. And we are now fighting a, a different battle, a mental battle, which is a lot harder to fight. You, than talk, you spoke of mental chains yes. in your book. Mental you chains. Mental chains need to be broken. They're hard to break right now. Very hard to break because when you're fighting a physical battle, you can point the enemy out there. It's the judge, it's the police, etc. But in this day's world, the biggest enemy is inside. It's you, it's yourself. Your grandfather, and you, you write about this, he loved children, he loved family. Um, you know, when he first met you, there was that smile as he looked at all of, all of his grandchildren and all of that. Um, your foundation, the Africa Rising Foundation, is aimed at the youth. Yes. Um, spreading culture, education. Um, what are the, what is, if you had to say, what is the main, the absolute main goal right now of your foundation and how successful has it been to date? Well, our, our main mission is we are a catalyst in order to empower young people to empower themselves to be at the forefront of Africa's development. Now, th those are big words, okay? Those are big words and, 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 and noble, inspiring. <laughs> but you know as well as I, right? The, the education rankings among developed countries put South Africa right now near the bottom. Of course. In terms of education. Because we have ministers of education who are going against the grain, who have lowered the pass rate to 30%. Mm. I mean, where have you ever heard of such a thing? What's the illiteracy right now? What is it? How many South African children can read? Um, I, I, I'm, I'm shocked to hear that apparently 60 to 70 percent of our youth cannot read. 60 to 70 percent. And I, is most of that black I could, youth? I could, is it I white even, youth? Is I couldn't it, even believe it. Yeah. Is it black or white? That's definitely mo that's it, mostly black youth. Mostly black. And it's, it's unbelievable because Nelson Mandela was such... He was a figure. He loved telling stories. He loved culture. He loved literature. He loved the folk tales. And he the... valued education more than anything you can believe. I mean, he took me in and sent my father, his son, to university at the age of 45. Wow. That is to the point that Nelson Mandela loves and believes in education. What do you think? We, we remember those images of he shared power. He gave a deputy position as uh, presidency to F.W. de Klerk, the man with whom he negotiated to dis dismantle apartheid. Right. He shared a Nobel Peace Prize with F.W. Right. de Klerk. Right. Do you see that same spirit of reconciliation so dear to your grandfather still alive in South Africa today? It is alive and I can see it uh, when you look at the new administration, Cyril Ramaphosa. You know, he's really going out of his way to try and, you know, quell the fears of the farmers of the white, uh, you know, owners of the economy, basically, uh, to make sure that, guys, nobody is getting killed. This is not Fox News where we tell lies to the world about people getting killed over land in South Africa. That has not happened. Not a single farm has been appropriated to date. We are in a discussion, a constructive discussion to see, guys, is it a five-year plan? Is it a 10-year plan? I personally have a 10-year plan of how we can make these things happen for everybody. Uh, but, of course, that's, a, that's another discussion I, I'm going to have with, with our president. With the president. How is Nelson Mandela, oh, I talk about legacy, that's a big word. How is Nelson Mandela taught to the new generation of South Africans? What, what is said about him, kids who never knew him? I believe what is said is that he is the first democratically elected president, the father of democracy, a man who sacrificed everything in order to free his people, right? Free his people from the oppression, from the tyranny, that existed before he came along. And he's a man that believes in the youth. He's a man that believes in women empowerment mm. and education. You know, in order for us to be able to break the cycle of poverty, we need to get ourselves the necessary skills and the training that we can use as tools to achieve our goals and our dreams. The youth today are the masters of their destiny. But if they don't, if they don't have access to information and technology, it's gonna be very difficult for us to get to where we want to go. You told me before we went on air that your grandfather, he never wanted to be president. He was asked to do it. He was almost, he did as a duty in a sense. And he chose not to run for a second term. He was sending an implicit message outside South Africa to other African leaders, perhaps, about power? 100%. You know, first of all, Madiba felt that he was out of touch with the new world because he had been in jail for 30, 30 years, t three decades. And so he felt that younger generation who are much more... Um, you know, at ease with this new world, should be the ones to lead the world. But, of course, he was the face of the struggle, so he didn't have a choice. He had to do it. He had to do it. <laughs> and when he decided, okay, I have no choice, I have to do it, I will make sure I only take one term. 
because I've seen what is happening on this African continent. And let me try and influence my fellow African brothers to share power, to say that even when you have given up power, it does not mean that is the end of the world. That it's a tall order <laughs> in the very little time, briefly, that we have left. When you look, not just in South Africa, beyond at the world today, do you see anyone else who vaguely resembles Nelson Mandela in his ability to inspire and to elevate? Well, I would say uh, former President Barack Obama. He did an amazing job. I would say Sir John Sirleaf of Liberia. I would say uh, uh, President Banda, former president of Malawi. I would say even Paul Kagame of Rwanda. Well, this is a longer list than I was expecting. <laughs> Daba Mandela, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, uh, an interesting book, uh, the Going to the Mountain, now out in French under the title Le Courage de Pardonner, and uh, in which you talk about the life lessons imparted to you by your grandfather, which we didn't talk about here, yes. but I'll leave it to my readers to discover for themselves. Thank you very much for, uh, for being here today. Thank you for having me. And uh, good luck to you on your, on your mission. Thank you very much. Thanks all of you for watching the interview here on France 24. Sur France 24, la nuit, on est très fiers d'accompagner les Amériques dans leur soirée, de voir l'Asie se réveiller, et on est là jusqu'à ce que Paris s'éveille. France 24 est plus que seulement noticias. C'est liberté, égalité et actualité. Nous donnons un pas plus loin, avec des informations au moment pour analyser, comprendre, mettre en perspective et débattre. Sur France 24, l'Afrique, c'est chic. In Live from Paris, our correspondents around the world keep you up to date. Vous êtes déjà plusieurs millions et de plus en plus nombreux à suivre France 24 sur les réseaux sociaux. Min al-tabi'a an yakuna shi'arouha al-hurriya wa khassat al-hurriya al-ta'bir fi balad hurriya al-ta'bir.